Good evening, and welcome to ENG 099 Conversational American English. In this is the December 2012 version, the first time I'm running this course. The topic of tonight's lecture is reading American fiction, and this is the sixth lecture out of ten. Hi. So I hope you all are doing well and are excited about uh, learning more about reading American fiction. Um, so tonight, to start, I'm going to go through, just going to do a quick catch-up of the course in general and go over quick ways you can get involved. And then I'm going to give, talk about reading American fiction. That'll be the conversational American English section. After that, I am going to, we're going to do the next language talk. We've done five so far. We're going to do the sixth language talk, six out of ten. And then following that, we are going to read some more of The Gift of the Magi, a wonderful short story that we've been slowly working our way through. All right. Well, without further ado, Let's uh, let's get started on reading American fiction. Just give me a couple seconds here to translate over. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is the Etherpad that we are using in this class. Um, this is where we're adding notes, and you can come on in here and join it. The URL is piratepad, P-I-R-A-T-E-P-A-D dot net dot N-E-T slash E-N-G-099, lowercase. And it is also linked to from the Mr. Danoff uh, from the homepage of the course. So this is the course homepage, as you know. And these are the lectures. They're all you can catch up on all five of them, and the sixth one will be there later tonight. And then this is the pirate pad. So you can just come in here and start typing. These are the notes right now. You could join me and ask some questions, or just start typing. And you can also go through the bottom of here to catch up where we've been on. But the best way to catch up is by clicking this lectures button. And then coming here, and it has all the lectures. Lecture one, I've broken down into four parts, and I plan on doing that for the rest of them. But for right now, the, the other lectures you can just access as a whole. Just watch the video, you'll get a nice idea of these different topics. And this is where we're at tonight. Okay, and also, so you can participate to register. Uh, this, you can register here. It's also just on the home page, as you can see here. Just register right here. Let me know you're interested. Um, and there's also a PDPU study group. As you can see here. This is the PDPU study group. Then there you can participate via Facebook. So this is the Facebook. It's part of the Mr. Dance Teaching Laboratory Facebook page. So it has information there about how you can join. Oh, well, I guess I'm on the wrong tab here. Okay. All right, let's try that again. Okay, so this is the home page. This is the Etherpad where you can jump in. It's embedded on the home page. If you want to register, you can do it right here. It's very easy. Or you can do it by clicking here. And then there's a, you can join the PDPU study group. Or you can get involved through Facebook or you can get involved through Wikiversity. Additionally, if you uh, start your own blog, that'd be wonderful, and then share information with us. I mean, then do the assignments via your own blog. Assignments are here. Okay. 
All right. Well, let's um, let's jump into let's jump into reading American fiction. So, American fiction. We've been reading some already, um, as I'm sure you remember, with the gift of the Magi. And so, what is fiction? You may be asking. What is fiction? That's a great question. Fiction is a story that is not true. It's not true. What does that mean? It means that it didn't really happen. So, something that is true, for example, like a nonfiction story, it really, really did happen. Um, it's maybe the author <clears throat> maybe the maybe it's a story of a trial or of a, of a sports star but that really happened to the sports star it's being written about the sports star or a biography of a famous leader or king or queen or president um, those are all examples of nonfiction. They are true, and certainly the author has a lot of choices to make in how they tell a true story that not everybody may agree with, but that is different than fiction. Fiction, it's all fake. Everything is fake. The best example of to take one from Good Readers and Good Writers, which is a wonderful essay by Vladimir Nabokov that I will rec that I recommend you read after this lecture on your own. Fiction was invented the day that the boy cried wolf. So I'm sure you're familiar with this story. The boy is um, he comes up to his parents and he says, "There's a wolf! There's a wolf in the woods!" Then the parents go and look. And everybody's all excited, and the boy's happy because they're all excited, but there is really no wolf. He was lying. And then, so everybody's, oh, okay, okay, good, there's no wolf. And then, again, the little boy, he comes and he tells his parents, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. And his parents get all excited, oh my god, oh my god, there's a wolf, we gotta help save you. But they go, and there is no wolf. The third time, the little boy tells a story about the wolf. Nobody believes him. And that time, it's true. There is a wolf, and he gets eaten. So, the story that he created about the wolf not being true, that's an example of fiction. Fiction's a lie. It's not true. Some famous fiction stories that I'm sure you... Yeah, like The Wolf, or um, Snow White is another very famous fictional story, or... And I wish I had some that were not from Western cultures, but I don't have any at the top of my head. But, okay. So fiction is a story that's not true. All right. Now we're going to go into a little more, a little bit better examples of what I'm trying to say. Okay. I'm going to start off with a couple quotes. This is from How Should One Read a Book, which is an essay written by Virginia Woolf who is a very, very famous fictional author from uh, England in the about 100 years ago, about 90 to 100 years ago now. Okay. So this is an essay, How Should One Read a Book? This is the beginning of the essay. <clears throat> in the first place, oh, I want to emphasize the note of interrogation at the end of my title. So she wants to emphasize, which she wants you to focus on the note of interrogation. Interrogation is a question. So she wants to, you to focus on this question mark at the end of her title. Even if I could answer the question for myself, the answer would apply only to me and not to you. So she's saying that if there is a right answer, if there's an answer, how should one read a book for her then the answer will be different for you. 
The answer, the way to read a book is different for everybody. Everybody has a different style of reading a book, and that's okay. The only advice, indeed, that one person can give another about reading is to take no advice, to follow your own instincts, to use your own reason, to come with your own conclusion, to come to your own conclusions. <clears throat> and I repeat Mrs. Wolf's advice that you should trust yourself when you're reading. Trust yourself, more importantly, what you feel, what you think is most important. Don't let people tell you that it's not important. Now, that does not mean that there are, that you can learn or people can help you to read better. That is why you're here watching this lecture and why I'm giving it. But it's important also to respect your own talent and your own ability to read. That is very, very important. Okay? So now, if we understand each other, I'm going to give you some ideas about how to read better, but if they don't work for you, that's fine. It's totally fine. You need to find what works for you. All right. We're talking about fiction. I mean, talking about fiction, but this could also apply to any type of reading. This advice. All right. Now, another quote from Good Readers, Good Writers by Vladimir Bokov that you can find online there. I'll put the links um, on the lecture page afterwards. In reading, one should notice and fondle details. There is nothing wrong about the moonshine of generalization when it comes after the sunny trifles of the book have been lovingly collected. All right. In reading, one should notice and fondle details. So what are details? Details are little information about the story. So the story is about a man who was in love with a woman and they had lots of trouble and then they came together and it was beautiful. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic of the story. What Mr. Nabokov is telling you, the most important, or not the most important, but one of the most important parts, equally important maybe, are the details. What color was her hair? What was the weather like that day when they first met? What was the man feeling? What did he have for lunch before they met? All these little details are so important. These are what make up the story. Okay. There's nothing wrong about the moonshine of generalization when it comes after the sunny trifles of the book have been lovingly collected. There's nothing... Generalization is saying, like, oh, all books by men are only about war, or this book is about war. Maybe it is, but you need to be careful about generalizing. You should only generalize after you've paid attention to all the different details. And this is very difficult. This takes time and effort and is not always fun, but it's important because if one begins with a ready-made generalization, one begins at the wrong end and travels away from the book before one has started to understand it. What does that mean? That means if you start by saying that this book is about war, then you won't actually read the book. You'll only read what you see that makes what you think is true. Let me say that again. If you say this book is about war, then you're not going to pay attention to the details about the color of the woman's dress or about the, <clears throat> maybe about the, how the, discussion between political leaders, um, what they were drinking while they were talking, or what the weather was like, those type of details. And there are many, many, many more details that I can't, I'm not saying right now, but those details are very important because those details, those details are a big part of what the book is about. And if you don't actually read them, if you, do, if you, if you have a generalization, this book is about war, generalization speak in general, this book is then you won't look at the stuff where maybe for one, a few pages, the main character, he wasn't even thinking about the war. He was thinking about how he wants to be a writer and it's so difficult and all these things. But So the book is really about, it's about a war and it's about a young writer trying to become, find his voice. And 
If you just say this book's about war, you'll miss that other detail. That's an example. Okay? Okay, so to summarize those two quotes, the first quote from Miss Wolf is telling you, trust yourself. You are very talented. You can do this. You can read on your own, assuming you know how to read English, of course, but after you learn how to read English, you can read for yourself. And the details that you notice and what you think about the book is very important. You should figure that out by yourself. Okay. And the second quote is telling you to pay attention to the details. Do not just worry about this book's about war. I need to write my paper. You need to think also about all the different little details that the author gives you because they're there for a reason. Everything in fiction is fake. Nothing is there because the author had to put it there. It's there for a reason. Or nothing is there because the author chose it just everything is there in the book by choice the author put that detail in there for a reason they didn't do it just for <laughs> I don't know, well, you see what I'm saying? the author wrote the book they made it up they made up all those details so for them it was important to have all that information it should be important for you as well. Okay. All right. Now, let's go into this Wikipedia article. Okay. And uh, before we do, I'm using a Wikipedia article here for my lecture, but I want you to keep in mind you need to be very careful with trusting Wikipedia. Um, it's not always right. And this is true of any book, but especially Wikipedia or any book or any web page or anything and um, if you be careful when you use it if you're gonna use it in class because some teachers do not like it and you need to have lots of different sources anyway but Wikipedia is a dangerous one and a very useful one okay alright so we're starting in the article we're starting in the elements of fiction section okay even among writing instructors and best-selling authors, there is little consensus regarding the number and composition of the fundamental elements of fiction. So little consensus. So that means that not a lot of people agree about what is most important in fiction. Fiction has three main elements, plotting, character, and place or setting. It's from this gentleman in 2006. <laughs> A charged image evokes all the elements of your story, theme, character, conflict, setting, style, and so on. For writers, the spices you add to make your plot your own include characters, setting, and dialogue. Contained within the framework of the story are three major story modes, character, action, and conflict. I think point of view is one of the most fundamental elements of fiction writing craft. As stated by Janet Ivanovich, Effective writing requires understanding of the fundamental elements of storytelling, such as point of view, dialogue, and setting. The debate continues as to the number and composition of the fundamental elements of fiction. So what all this is saying is that even amongst the greatest authors ever and the most the best teachers ever, there's not one true thing that's like a novel or a piece of fiction has to have this, 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 and then it's real fiction. There's lots of debate. There's lots of people who disagree. Fiction is a crazy place. And um, some, some people would say plots, like he goes here, and then he falls in love, and then he kills a man, and then he dies. That's most important. Others would say plot doesn't matter. Okay? So again, what I'm trying to say is, you, is your thoughts are very important how you feel and what you think about fiction. You need to respect yourself and then move on from there and then find people you like or you agree with and some people disagree with you. Okay, but in order to help you think about it, I'm going to give you some big idea, big sort of parts of fiction and so you can have those and what you think. Plot. Plot is what the characters did, said, and thought. Okay, so it's what characters do, say, or think. It is the action proper given unity by the enveloping action. The inverse, uh, all right. As Aristotle said, 
What gives a story unity is not, the, is not as the masses believe that it is about one person, but that it is about one action. Plot or storyline is often listed as one of the fundamental elements of fiction. Okay, so plot is, you can keep reading here later if you want, but plot is what happens. Characters did say or think. Exposition refers to a fictional story's initial setup, where variably setting is established, characters introduced, and conflict is initiated. For example, it was a dark and stormy night. The young widow, glare, the young widow glared at the shadowy man <coughs> dripping on her kitchen floor. Told you my husband's not home, she said. He smiled and rictus, he, he smiled and rictus smile and shut the door behind him. Tell me something I don't know. Okay? So exposition is how you set up a story. Plot is what happens in the story. Foreshadowing is a technique used by authors to provide clues so the reader can break might occur later in the story. So if something happens and it seems like it doesn't matter, maybe it's a sign of something to come later. All right. Then rising action, we'll go over that, read that yourself if you want. And climax. So the climax is the everything is leading up to the climax. And the climax, for example, in a story about uh, trial, the climax is when the jury makes their decision. Okay? Whoa. All right. And conflict. Okay. So conflict is the problem of what happens. You have to have a problem in fiction. Even if it's not a very clear problem, you have to have a problem. And the problem is what the story is about. There's no problem, there's no story. Resolution. So it's when the problem is solved is the resolution. That's the climax. And again, these are all just examples of not all of these have to be there for fiction, but it's good for you to be aware of them as you're reading in order for to understand better. Okay? All right. So I'll provide links to all those resources um, online and you can look at them yourself. Uh, actually, they're all already in the Etherpad. You can, they're in the bottom of the Etherpad, um, or in this part, portion of the Etherpad. I'll leave that up there on the main page now for the next day so you can see it. And, yep. Yeah. All right. So that's the end of the fiction section of this, uh, Reading American Fiction section of this lecture. Now we're going to move on to language talk. All right. Okay. So, language talk. On the following sentences, let the pupils be exercised according to the model. So, model. Intemperate degrades. Why is this a sentence? Intemperance. Intemperance degrades. Intemperance is drinking. Temperance is not drinking. Drinking alcohol, so it degrades, it makes you worse. Why is this a sentence? Answer. Because it expresses a thought. Of what is something thought? Intemperance. Which word tells us what is thought? Degrades. All right. So, this is similar to last language talk. There is uh, two words, two words, and you have to think about them as a sentence. All right, so I want you to go through the same thing for all of these. All right, so I'll help you with this one again. But <clears throat> all right, so for magnets attract, why is this a sentence? Uh, well, this is going to be the same answer for all of them because it expresses a thought. Of what is something thought? Magnets. Which word tells us what is thought? Attract. Okay. So for all of these, these are sentences. They may seem small, but it has a thought. It has, you're thinking about magnets, and what are you thinking about them? They attract. You're thinking about intemperance, and you're thinking it degrades. Drinking too much makes you worse. Okay. In this sentence. 
And maybe in life. Who knows? All right. All right. Well, not who knows, but there's different opinions and degrees. Anyway. Okay. You see that in these sentences, there are two parts. The parts are the subject and the predicate. Okay. The subject of a sentence names that of which something is thought. So the subject is what the sentence is about, the main idea. So we're thinking about magnets. That's the subject. We're, that's what we're thinking about. The predicate or complement of a sentence tells us what is thought. So what are we talking about? What's the subject? Magnets. What do we think? They attract. Okay. Definition. The analysis of a sentence is the separation of it into its parts. So analyzing a sentence is separating it into its different parts so you can think about it. Okay. Now, a couple more models. Analyze. So stars twinkle, this sentence. This is a sentence because it expresses a thought. Stars is the subject because it names that of which something is thought. So that's what we're thinking about. Twinkle is the predicate because it tells what is thought. All right. Okay. And so if you want, you can go through those yourself. All right. Okay. So the big thing there is focusing on the subject and complement or predicate of a sentence. The subject, again, which goes back to language talk, a sentence is a thought made up of ideas. <clears throat> Uh, magnets. The word magnets are real, but the word magnet, M-A-G-N-E-T, is expresses an idea, the idea of magnets. You may not have a magnet in front of you, but the word gets you to think about the idea. And then magnets attract is a sentence. It has the subject, magnets, and the complement, attract. Makes a sentence. All right. Um, and then more examples there you can go through if you'd like. For now, I'm going to move on to the last part of this lecture is the Gift of the Magi. This is part 6 of 10. All right. Okay. So if you remember, Della had just decided, had just gone to a hair shop. A hair shop. And now she's talking to the lady at the hair shop. All right. So Della asks, will you buy my hair? And why does she want to sell her hair? If you remember from earlier, it's because... She wants money to buy her husband a Christmas present. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. All right. So this is very like, this is slang. Slang, not proper English, but in fiction, it's okay to use slang. All right. And then also, down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mask with a practiced hand. The mask, the hair. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hash metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. All right. So she got her money, and then she spent two hours looking for Jim's present. All right. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. So she found Jim's present, and there was no other like it in any of those stores. Nobody else had it. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by <clears throat> meretriculous ornamentation, as all good things should do. So it's a nice, she got a chain for her husband's pocket watch, so a uh, cord for his pocket watch. It was even worthy of the watch. All right, the watch. That's Jim's watch, that's why it's capitalized, Once you to pay attention. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value. The description of it at <clears throat> quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the salon on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. So sometimes he's embarrassed about looking at the watch because it has a leather strap instead of a proper gold chain. All right, so what happened here? Della sold her hair for $20, and then she used the money 
to buy a watch. All right. And again, those are that's the plot. Those are the, the details are these are all the details. This is all the information about the watch, quietness and value. Description applied to both. So this tells you what she feels about Jim. Jim is not a very like he doesn't wear nice like crazy crazy clothes or he doesn't talk like loud. He's very quiet and he's a man of value. He's a good man. Just like that chain she got. So that's an example of where the details are really important. All right. All right. It's been just over a half hour. I think that's enough time. So please get involved with uh, ENG 099, Conversational American English. Uh, there are four lectures left. The schedule's at mr.danoff.org slash ENG 099, all lowercase. And you can reach me at contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, at mr.danoff.org or Twitter at Danoff or Facebook.com slash Teaching Lab. You can also find me on Wikiversity and PDPU as is linked to on the course homepage. Thank you for joining and have a wonderful night.